From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Alongside Joe Matthew, I'm Kaylee Lines. President Biden holds trilateral talks with the leaders of Japan and the Philippines to counter a growing threat from China, even as the administration prepares for a possible attack by Iran against Israel. We'll talk this hour with former Defense Secretary Leon Panetta. Plus, the latest read on wholesale inflation brings some relief after another hot CPI report this week. We'll be joined by Heather Boucher of the White House Council of Economic Advisors. And as Speaker Mike Johnson prepares to join Donald Trump for a news conference tomorrow at Mar-a-Lago, we'll talk with our political panel about the influence Trump is holding over the congressional agenda. Kaylee, that's going to be the big talker, of course, mm-hmm. that will generate the headlines, and it probably should. But one of the least reported stories of the day and maybe the moment here in Washington, this trilateral meeting that President Biden is holding with an eye on China. Absolutely. Not just with the Japanese Prime Minister, Fumio Kishida, who, of course, was there for a bilateral meeting at the White House yesterday, but together with the president of the Philippines, as they really are looking at the South China Sea and figuring out what they can do there. And, of course, it's not just the White House where these leaders are visiting. In fact, the prime minister was on Capitol Hill earlier today where he was talking about the China issue in his address to lawmakers. Here he is. China's current external stance and military actions present unprecedented and the greatest strategic challenge, not only to the peace and security of Japan, but to the peace and stability of international community at large. Speaking to a joint session of Congress today as we now bring in Bloomberg's Dan Flatley and Michelle Jamrisco to talk about our top stories. Let's start there, uh, Michelle. It's important to frame the significance of these talks against a background that's very noisy right now in Washington. How important is this meeting today? Well, really, I mean, if you had to say it in one word, it's about China. Not to be cynical, I mean, I know we hear the administration talk a lot about their proactive use of this sort of lattice work, as they call it, of Indo-Pacific partnerships. But really, what this trilateral meeting is about is helping uh, shore up an alliance, a creative new grouping Mm -hmm. of Indo-Pacific partners for the U.S. and show support for for what they're trying to do to defend against uh, attacks and and what the U.S. says is increasing coercion and uh, aggressiveness in the South China Sea and other disputed waters in the Indo-Pacific. So perhaps instead of a North Atlantic alliance like NATO is, this is a new Pacific alliance, Dan. Yeah, I mean, this is an effort that's gone back uh, certainly to the beginning of the Biden administration. And, you know, you saw a little bit of it in the, in the prior administration as well. But and I, uh, the idea here is basically to shore up these alliances in the, in the Indo-Pacific, as you said, and to basically have these friendships, these alliances, these things in place should something happen you know, an invasion of Taiwan, an embargo, a trade embargo with Taiwan, some other action by China that stops short of a full-on invasion, and basically have everybody sort of on the same page. And, and you know, you see this um, ongoing with a lot of trips, uh, certainly by by members of the State Department and, and others to the, um, sorry, not to the Middle East, to mm-hmm. the we'll Pacific. Get we'll get there. <laughs> yeah. um, but, uh, but now, you know, kind of cementing that with, with the visit uh, today. Well, to what extent, uh, to Kaylee's point, can this be, uh, consolidated and, and formalized, as long as China is considered a threat, should there be something closer to a NATO? We're actually talking about Japan helping to support or work as a second pillar to the AUKUS alliance. How about connecting the dots on all of these? Is that possible? Yeah, a lot of that formalization is is really long in coming, I think. I, what we're hearing from officials is we're in early talks on this, we're in early talks on that. But mm-hmm. I think really what we're looking at coming out of this trilateral today is what are they going to do about what they've signaled uh, Uh, is an increasing uh, plan to use joint military drills, as they did on Sunday with Australia, Japan, Philippines, the U.S. That that sort of squad, as I've heard some officials call it, um, is going to be drawn on in the future. And they just haven't been specific specific about where and how frequent those drills will continue. But that is a major development in terms of defending in the South China Sea. Yeah, so obviously one theater to keep an eye on, and there's other theaters as well, as Dan brings up, the Middle East. And potentially what 
is a coming Iranian retaliation for the strike Israel conducted in Damascus against an Iranian embassy. We don't know exactly what form it could take, but U.S. officials have voiced uh, concern about it being imminent. And we spoke about it with retired General Mark Kimmett earlier today on balance of power. What exactly Iran could do here? This is what he said. It would be likely that perhaps not in the Middle East, but Iran could, in fact, go after an Iranian, uh, go after an Israeli embassy somewhere in South America that would take their fingerprints on of it, off of it if they use a group like Hezbollah. Uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. And uh, there wouldn't be direct attribution. So it kind of raises the question, Dan, of whether this would be Iran directly, an Iranian proxy, as the general thought might be more likely. And frankly, how aggressive or de-escalatory Iran may want to be here. What does the U.S. fear will happen? What do they think is most likely to happen? Well, certainly the biggest fear that, that the administration has at this point is just a general escalation of tensions in the Middle East. You know, we've seen some uh, and heard some, you know, no, some noise from, from the Israelis that you know, the operation in Gaza may start to wind down a little bit. Um, you know, whether that actually comes to fruition, we need to see. But uh, a strike by Iran on, uh, on any sort of Israeli asset in the region would certainly be an escalatory action. There's no way to view it in, in any other uh, case. Uh, but uh, a strike, an indirect strike, as the general suggested, uh, that Iran could deny in some sense, even though there, there would certainly be linkages that, that people would point to, would be something that stops short of that full-scale escalation. Although, um, you know, what could happen after that point is sort of uh, we're entering into somewhat uncharted territory because we haven't really seen this sort of full-scale mm -hmm. conflagration in the Middle East uh, yet. And, and I think that's what the administration has been trying to avoid. Well, this is the White House that's spinning a lot of plates in a dangerous world right now. The press secretary, Karine Jean-Pierre, uh, talked earlier today about terrible news from Ukraine. Russia's missile attack on a power plant near Kyiv, the biggest one in the Kyiv region, it is now out of commission and there are great concerns about the lack of ammunition in Ukraine. Here's the press secretary. Russia launched another large round of aerial assaults against Ukraine's energy grid as Vladimir Putin's continue to try to break the spirit, the spirit of the Ukrainian people and plunge them into darkness. Russia struck the largest power plant in Kyiv, Oblast, as well as a power facilities in five other regions across Ukraine. Michelle, I don't know if we can connect the dots uh, between what's been happening here with the concerns uh, that the U.N. has right now about the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant with the lack of ammo. But clearly the skies are not being defended in Ukraine across the country, uh, at least as much even as we were seeing before. This White House is going to continue talking about headlines like this mm -hmm. until funding is passed and there's no path for that to take place. Yeah. Joe Biden, Biden is running out of options here. Yeah, and in some ways this is the same conversation we've been having since before the winter set in because you know we, we had National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby talking about how the winter would be a trying time and that yeah. they knew that Russia would try to attack the energy infrastructure especially to really cripple Ukraine. So we're at that stage and yet uh, you know in talking about Ukraine funding and going back to Prime Minister Kishida in in the Congress today, mm -hmm. uh, we saw him you know kind of make that call for for allies to support the Ukraine funding, and some of the Republican stalwarts against that funding were, were clearly seated yeah. and sitting on their hands in that, in that format. So mm -hmm. we'll see where it goes from here, but really hasn't been much movement in that conversation. Well, you f can find Republicans easily who are opposed to further funding for Ukraine, but you could also find 19 of them yesterday who were opposed to advancing legislation <laughs> for a five-year extension of FISA, the Foreign Surveillance Warrantless Surveillance Act, specifically uh, Section 702. That was a five-year extension. We now understand from our Bloomberg report on the Hill, that lawmakers are now going to try to pass a two-year extension. The Rules Committee is going to sit with it tonight. There will be votes early tomorrow morning. How important is it for U.S. national security that this gets done, Dan? What do you hear on this issue? Well, certainly when you talk to folks in the administration and you talk to folks on the Hill who are proponents of this measure, they say that without this, the U.S. will basically go dark, that it will have no ability to really see into certainly conversations between foreign adversaries and folks who may be uh, planning stuff or communicating with them here on U.S. soil. The issue, of course, is do U.S. citizens get swept up in that kind of, 
of a dragnet. And that is really the question. That's what former President Donald Trump has, has made a lot of noise about and his, his uh, allies in Congress. But really, you know, if you listen to the national security folks on this, they'll say, without this, we're sort of blind and we don't know what's going on. Um, but you talk to some of the civil, um, you know, liberty advocates or some of the folks who are on the right or the left, and they say this is really warrantless surveillance. This is uh, ca catching U.S. citizens in a way that is not intended. Uh, and so maybe a two-year extension is a way to sort of keep this uh, debate alive to a certain extent. I mean, it would certainly uh, land it in the middle of the next administration, whoever's in office. Yeah. And so, you know, that may be seen as, as a way to keep this debate going um, in order to satisfy some of the critics and some of the proponents at the same time. All right. Well, I guess we'll see if this rule can be more successful than the last. Dan Flatley and Michelle Jamrisco, thank you both so much for joining us. Now, coming up, we'll turn to the White House. Heather Boucher of the Council of Economic Advisors will be with us to reflect on today's inflation data and the hot data we got yesterday. That's next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. Well, I do stand by my prediction that before the year is out, there'll be a rate cut. This may delay it a month or so. I'm not sure of that. I don't, we don't know what the Fed is going to do for certain. But look, we have dramatically reduced inflation from 9 percent down to close to 3 percent. We're in a situation where we're better situated than we were when we took office, where we, inflation was skyrocketing. And we have a plan to deal with it. That was President Biden yesterday reacting to the March CPI report, reiterating his prediction of a Fed rate cut this year. And now we go back to the White House. When joining us is Heather Boucher, a member of the White House Council of Economic Advisors. Heather, thank you so much for joining us here on Bloomberg Television and Radio this evening. Usually we understand that for you and your colleagues, you are reluctant to comment on Fed policy. But given President Biden himself weighed in yesterday, I feel more comfortable asking you this question. Do you share his view that the Fed will cut this year? Well, um, I cannot comment on Fed policy, and the, the president wasn't really commenting on Fed policy either. He was, you know, answering a question about what what everyone knows, as you all talk about on the on television all the time. You know, uh, what we think they'll do. Here's the thing. You know, as the president noted, we have brought inflation down markedly. It's down by 60 percent. And, you know, and the, the economy continues to uh, grow at a healthy clip. We saw over 300,000 jobs um, last Friday. We got that for March. We continue to see this economy delivering for the American people. And, um, you know, and the president continues to work to make sure that he's lowering costs for families, even as he is focused on growing the economy from the middle out. Well, Dr. Boucher, I have to throw all my questions out. I thought the, it was open season on the Fed after what the president said yesterday. Now, now that you've set us straight once again, talk to us about the PPI data this morning. Everyone seems to be feeling at least a bit of relief after a freakout that followed the CPI yesterday. It, to the extent that this is a forward-looking indicator, what does it tell you about the trajectory for prices? Well, um, certainly, you know, when we got the CPI data yesterday, um, it, was, it came in hotter than expected. It was at the same um, rate as in February. And so that was sort of, you know, made us all like, oh, well, you know, we're, we're not seeing the kind of um, uh, lower, lower inflation that we'd like to see. But certainly today's news, uh, I think, tempers that a little bit. It, it, it muddies the, the forecast, if you will. Um, you know, if we'd gotten something hotter, maybe we would think that the trajectory had changed. But I think it's clear that we have been on this path of lowering prices over time. Inflation has been coming down. And I think we continue to be on that trajectory. Um, you know, granted, it has been a little bit slower uh, more lately. But of course, we are down now in the 3% range for inflation. And that is far below where we were um, during, the, um, during the peak of the, of, um, of the higher inflation rates. Well, Heather, as, as you talk about the idea that maybe you're not seeing quite the progress that you would have expected to or like to see at this point, what is your degree of confidence that we're not going to see an outright reacceleration? Stagnation and deceleration is one thing, but do you see any forces at work in the economy that could suggest that inflation might actually pick back up? 
Listen, we are in such a different moment than we were when inflation spiked, right? We were coming out of the pandemic. We were seeing these real significant challenges with supply chains all around the world. And then, of course, we had Putin's unprovoked war in the Ukraine that upended global energy prices. We have weathered these challenges. And quite frankly, the United States has weathered these far better in many ways than many of our economic competitors. We've seen stronger growth. We've seen our unemployment rate now below 4 percent for 25 months in a row. And we've seen our prices come down quite, quite markedly, especially relative to our economic competitors. So looking forward, I think we have this strength um, that we are dealing. We have this strength, this strong foundation foundation to stand on. And we aren't seeing the same kinds of shocks that we had seen that got us into the higher prices in the first place. I know part of your modeling on the Council of Economic Advisors includes trying to figure out where we're going to be months into the future. Heather Bruchet, can you tell us where inflation is expected to be around Labor Day when people start paying attention to the political conversation in this country? Well, as, as I think I've noted before, I don't actually have a crystal ball. Um, we certainly <laughs> do um, at the Council of Economic Advisors. We are certainly looking at these numbers all the time. We are looking at the whole economy, um, trying to understand, you know, are we going to continue to see job growth at the pace that we've seen it? Will we can see that investment boom uh, continue? And where will prices be? You know, and we, we believe that we will continue to see this pace slowing over time, as we have been seeing. They've been coming down. And, of course, the president has been focused on using all the tools that he has at his disposal to make sure that he lowers costs for families. So this is the first president to be negotiating with big pharma over prescription drug prices. That's going to lower prices for seniors all across the country. Of course, he's lowering the cost of student debt for you know all of those bar borrowers. He made a big announcement earlier this week, and it's going to affect 30 million borrowers across the country. And you know, is just really focused on on all the other ways that we see prices increase. For example, um, all the work that we've done across the administration to get rid of junk fees, um, you know, those hidden fees that we all have to deal with. So it's adding up these, you know, the president is doing his part to really address the fact that um, it's been hard on families to have these high prices and to do what he can to lower them. And finally, Heather, thank you so much again for joining us from the White House this evening, where, of course, somewhere in, in those buildings behind you, there is a meeting going on between President Biden and the president of the Philippines and the prime minister of Japan. And we know there has been some tension in the U.S.-Japan relationship in terms of the acquisition, attempted acquisition, at least, of Nippon Steel and U.S. Steel. The president, when he has spoken about this deal, cites that he has the backs of American steel workers, that he's committed to these American workers. What exactly is the economic concern for for these workers that would stem from a takeover like this? Well, the president has been very clear in, in so many points across this administration that he stands with workers, that he has their back, that he's making sure that his economic agenda is growing from the middle out. And, and part of what he means by that is making sure that workers are benefiting from economic growth. I think the concern here is, you know, workers want to make sure that they are benefiting from those investments that are happening in steel, that they are they um, uh, will continue to see their jobs and good jobs uh, moving into the future. And the president is also, you know, is as today we're witnessing, you know, is focusing on making sure that we have a good relationship with the Japanese. So, um, you know, he is focused on making sure that this economy works for people all across the country and delivers for them so that we can see the kind of growth that's going to benefit American families. Heather, thank you. Dr. Heather Boucher with us live from the White House on Balance of Power. Coming up, opposition to that Nippon Steel acquisition of U.S. Steel reaches the Capitol. Bloomberg's Tyler Kendall spoke with some of the deal's fiercest critics in Congress. We'll have that next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. I'm Joe Matthew alongside Kaylee Lines in Washington. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida addressed a joint session of Congress today as he continues a state visit to the U.S. Many of the lawmakers he spoke to in that chamber are opposed to Nippon's acquisition of U.S. steel. Bloomberg's Tyler Kendall has the details. Tyler? Yeah. Hey, Joe. Nippon Steel is Japan's 
biggest steelmaker, and it might get a lot bigger. The company is trying to buy the U.S. Steel Corporation for $14.1 billion, but its acquisition is facing some pushback from U.S. lawmakers. They're raising a list of concerns from national security to potential threats against unionized jobs. I had the chance to catch up with two Democratic senators from some steel-producing states who think President Biden should take a closer look at the merger. We're pushing the White House on national security grounds and on trade enforcement um, and fundamentally what this means to American workers and American jobs. My principal concern are those steelworker jobs, and uh, this deal gives me great concern about the, the threat to those jobs. That right there was Senator Bob Casey from Pennsylvania. U.S. Steel is a Pittsburgh-based company, and there's deep opposition to the deal there. The state is also critical to President Biden's re-election hopes. Our latest Bloomberg News Morning Consult poll finds Biden and former President Trump running even there. Trump claims he would block the deal altogether, but President Biden has to thread the needle with an important regional ally to counter China. He does say he'll side with the union, though, which called Nippon's pledge of a job protection a, quote, meaningless piece of paper. Here's how National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan put it earlier when asked about the president's stance. He's been very clear that he's going to stand up for American workers. He's going to defend their interests. He's also been very clear that he is going to make sure that the U.S.-Japan alliance is the strongest it's ever been. Not everyone is against the deal, though. Here's what Republican Senator Todd Young, he's from Indiana, the top producing steel state in the country, told me. Based on my reading of it, uh, the Nippon uh, Corporation desires to invest heavily in the workforce, uh, in the plant, in research and development, all things that have not been occur occurring to a sufficient degree. So I think this could be beneficial to the community. Nippon Steel says the deal will make the American steel industry more competitive. Direct employment in steel manufacturing is actually dropping in the U.S. It's down 49 percent over the last three decades and currently employs about 130,000 American workers. Joe and Kaylee, U.S. Steel shareholders are set to vote on the deal this Friday, but it comes as the Justice Department expands its antitrust investigation into the merger. It marks just another complicating factor. Yeah, so you have the antitrust investigation, CFIUS concerns around national security. But to the point that we heard from lawmakers, Tyler, also concerns about what this means for the unions. Right. And of course, the U.S. steelmaker union has endorsed President Biden in this general election, and he says he will have their back. He's really building his campaign on being a pro-union president. You'll remember he made history back in Michigan joining the picket line there. But of course, mm -hmm. former President Trump also joined him in Michigan addressing those workers. So we'll have to see uh, where these voters shake out. Indeed, we will. Bloomberg's Tyler Kendall, great reporting. Thank you so much. Now, coming up, we'll turn back to geopolitics as Russia attacks a key power plant near Kyiv. We'll have reaction from former U.S. Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. There is a fair question about whether radiation that comes from a power plant that's been deliberately attacked by Russia uh, and uh, wafts over the airspace of NATO countries could be considered uh, an event that would trigger Article 5. I mean, this is highly dangerous stuff. Jane Harman, chair of the National Defense Strategy Commission, and of course, former Congresswoman talking with us this week on Balance of Power about the possibility of invoking Article 5. Should the worst happen to Ukraine's nuclear plant in the east in Zaporizhia, the former Secretary of Defense, Leon Panetta, is with us now to hit this in a few hot spots around the world that have the administration's attention and the concern of the American people. Mr. Secretary, it's great to see you. We know that Vladimir Putin is capable of using cold as a weapon. He was more than willing to do that in winter. Now that Russia is targeting Ukraine's energy infrastructure, do you think he's willing to use this nuclear power plant as a weapon? Well, you know, we, we know Putin for what he is, uh, which is a tyrant. Uh, who won't stop uh, at uh, at attacking whatever 
a possible target he views as uh, as convenient for uh, what the Russians are, are doing in Ukraine. Uh, and so he's, he's threatened the use of nuclear weapons. Uh, he's threatened uh, the use of, uh, you know, uh, the effort to go after a nuclear plant if necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, so he clearly has threatened uh, to take those steps. Now, I think he's also got to know that if he does do something that results in a radiation uh, impact that could spread to other uh, countries, uh, he's asking for serious trouble. Uh, and, uh, Is it I think an Article 5 violation? Yeah, I, th I think Jane was right to at least raise the specter that uh, if other countries are impacted by this, uh, there clearly is at least uh, an issue involving Article 5 as to whether or not uh, there has been an attack on those countries. So uh, I think Putin has to really think long and hard about whether he really wants to get into that much trouble with NATO and the United States. Well, sir, obviously, around the question of Article 5, we have heard in the not-so-distant past from former president and presidential candidate Donald Trump on the idea that any NATO countries that weren't paying enough may not get U.S. protection if the day should come. And Donald Trump is meeting and doing a joint press conference with the Speaker of the House tomorrow at Mar-a-Lago. The Speaker has the power to decide the fate of Ukraine in the U.S. Congress. How worried are you about the nature of that relationship, knowing that Congress may very well never pass aid for Ukraine? Well, I'm, I'm very worried about it because uh, I think uh, the Congress and particularly uh, the Republican House uh, has really been very irresponsible uh, in dealing with this issue. Uh, I think, it, you know, there, there's no mistake here that, um, that our national security uh, is involved here. It's not just about protecting democracy in Ukraine. It's about protecting democracy in the 21st century. Uh, and we've made very clear that uh, Ukraine must win and that Putin must fail in his effort to try to undermine that democracy. The United States has taken a clear position with our NATO allies. Uh, and I think if Congress, uh, if the House should fail to provide the necessary aid that is required here for Ukraine, they are basically playing Putin's game uh, and playing into his hand. Uh, and that really does damage uh, our credibility in terms of our national security. If the United States cannot act as it should on a bipartisan basis uh, in providing the necessary aid that Ukraine requires. Secretary Panetta, there are great concerns that Iran may be about to strike in a retaliatory strike against Israel following Israel's strike in Damascus recently. The U.S. says that it will support Israel no matter what happens. And White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre today was asked about the threat from Iran and how the U.S. might respond to an attack against Israel. Here's what she said. We'll have you respond. I don't want to get into hypotheticals here. What we have made very clear, obviously, we've seen the threats uh, coming from uh, Iran. And so we have made ourselves very clear where we stand in supporting Israel's uh, security. That is ironclad. Does that, that does not change. I'm just not going to get into, uh, into details about our operational procedures from here. Mr. Secretary, with your background running both the Pentagon and the CIA, for that matter, I wonder what you're hearing about this, how concerned we should be. What's about to happen? Well, I, I'd be very concerned. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a couple things that are happening that are of deep concern. One is that uh, the latest reports are that uh, Iran has developed an, enough enriched nuclear fuel uh, that it could very, very soon uh, possess a nuclear weapon. Uh, that's unacceptable. Uh, and the United States has to make clear that that's unacceptable. Uh, and if Iran should... Uh, attack in any way, uh, directly attack Israel, uh, I think the United States has a responsibility uh, to come to Israel's defense in that kind of situation. So Iran ought to understand 
that uh, if it does make the decision to deliberately attack uh, Israel, that uh, it is asking for the kind of trouble and response that could very well undermine their own regime. Uh, if they want to put their regime on the line, uh, this is what they're asking. Well, Mr. Secretary, we just here this evening have discussed a hot war in the Middle East, a hot war on the continent of Europe. There is a trilateral meeting happening at the White House talking about uh, threats emanating from China. Certainly the world does feel very dangerous right now. And yet there is a live debate on Capitol Hill at the moment as to whether or not we should reauthorize warrantless surveillance. Section 702 specifically of FISA. Lawmakers are going to try again tomorrow on a shorter two-year extension after an effort to advance a five-year extension yesterday failed. What would you tell those on Capitol Hill weighing this measure as we speak? They should know about FISA and why it may be important as we face so many different conflicts. Look, I, I, I would tell them that they are elected by the American people in principle to not just govern, but to defend our security. And if they fail to pass and reauthorize uh, the FISA law, what they're doing is undermining our security because that's the one vehicle we have to be able to go after terrorists who have no other intention but to attack the United States of America. Terrorists have made that clear. We know that from 9-11, what they're after and our ability to gather intelligence from terrorists who are operating abroad is absolutely essential to our ability to provide security. I don't think we have to choose between protecting security and protecting our freedoms in this country. Uh, we have in this law protections to make sure that we are protecting the innocent uh, in, in the process of gathering this kind of intelligence. And there are reforms in this law uh, that enhance that ability. So this is not a choice between security or our freedoms. This is going to be a vote that determines whether or not we protect ourselves from the possibility of another terrorist attack. I hope those who are thinking about this vote understand that if they fail to provide this authorization, they are in large measure to blame for any terrorist attack that subsequently takes place. Wow, powerful words from a former Secretary of Defense. Leon Panetta, thank you so much for joining us this evening, sir. We appreciate your time. Good now, to be Now, coming up, you. we'll have more on lawmakers responding to the specter of a threat from Iran, trying to figure out a path forward on that FISA reauthorization. We'll discuss it all with our political panel next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. I think if Iran retaliates that we should proportionately or in a greater form go back. They better stay away from U.S. interests and they should watch themselves with respect to Israeli interests. Is Iran is the part of the cancer that's causing the problems in the Middle East. Senator Tom Tillis in the halls of Capitol Hill earlier today responding to reports of Iran planning a response, a retaliation to Israel's attack on its embassy in Syria last week. We're joined now for more by Republican strategist Lester Munson, principal at BGR Group, and Democratic strategist Caitlin Legacki, partner at Four Corners Public Affairs. So, Caitlin, it's interesting that we see the U.S. vocally saying if Iran were to move on Israel in some fashion, full stop, yeah. we have Israel's back. At the same time, that the Biden administration has really sharpened its tone in relation maybe not to Israel as a state itself, but certainly to the Netanyahu government. Would an attack from Iran or an Iranian proxy in some form make it that much more difficult for the U.S. to actually exercise any leverage it may have militarily? Yes, absolutely. And I think that's why the U.S. government is speaking so forcefully now. Like, the worst possible scenario that can happen in the Middle East right now is for the conflict between Israel and Hamas to break into a regional conflict. And so... Um, by trying to keep Iran and its proxies at bay, the U.S. is able to continue applying pressure to Netanyahu and the Israeli government to be responsible with their attacks in Gaza. 
Attacks in Gaza, we know there's a date for uh, an invasion in Rafah. We don't know what it is, and there are questions about whether Benjamin Netanyahu is, uh, is projecting here. But our uh, leader of CENTCOM is in, or Central Command, I should say, is in Israel right now preparing for what might happen as we anticipate a strike from Iran. The U.S. is all in on this. What are we prepared to do? Uh, well, I think we don't want to say what we're prepared to do, because uh, that could be part of a, a deterrent strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, but we, we need to be, uh, I think, as Caitlin was saying, like this is, this is a very serious situation. This is U.S. national security. Uh, our closest ally in the region is Israel at the end of the day, despite some of the atmospherics and the public statements about Gaza. At the end of the day, there's, there's a very strong relationship there, and the U.S. is going to take, is going to have Israel's back if there's a more open conflict with Iran. So obviously this is one of the many geopolitical issues that are live right now as we speak. There's also the hot war, of course, between Ukraine and Russia. But at the White House today, the focus really was on China, as there was a, as Joe has been pointing out, not as publicized trilateral meeting between the Japanese prime minister, the president of the Philippines and President Biden. A lot of focus on the South China Sea. Why was today's meeting important, even if we all maybe didn't give it the coverage it deserved? Well, I think it's important to know that what is really driving that meeting is not so much the Biden administration itself, although I think the president's doing the right thing by having the meeting, but China's behavior in the region. Mm -hmm. China is pushing its neighbors to uh, work together and work with the United States in order to contain the possible damage from China. Chinese ships are ramming Philippine ships. They're yeah. using lasers. Things are, things are very bad in what the Philippines calls the West Philippine Sea. Uh, and, and the U.S. is going to be involved there. We have, we have bases in the region. We have a, a military defense agreement with the Philippines. So it's important that the U.S. demonstrate that it is, uh, it is very actively engaged with the Philippines and Japan in this area to dissuade China from furthering these provocations. But that's, that's what's really driving us is China's behavior. It looks like military drills uh, will take place again involving the U.S., Japan, the Philippines. We saw this. Uh, recently, Beijing tends to get very upset when this happens. Is that the right approach here? I think we have to maintain a strong presence in the region, both to keep China in its lane, um, but also to show the other, either our allies in the region or the other emerging economies where China is trying to get them on their side, mm -hmm. that we are still there, we're still active, we're still involved, and we're going to be a good partner. Well, as we talk about the U.S., though, being active, and President Biden has suggested that he would come to Taiwan's defense if it ever proved necessary. Lester, you were just speaking about this notion that the U.S. isn't ruling anything out when it comes to protecting Israel. The U.S., though, very quickly ruled out putting boots on the ground in Ukraine when Russia invaded. What is different about that conflict than the other conflicts we're speaking of, that the U.S. has been very vocal in saying, yes, we will step in? if necessary. Well, the U.S. doesn't have a defense agreement with Ukraine. Sure. Uh, Russia has a lot of nuclear weapons. Russia has a lot of interests in Europe. We have a lot of European allies who are uh, perhaps, appearances aside, less enthusiastic about challenging Russia than we are. Yeah. So there's, there's, there's an art form to this, and not every situation is going to be exactly like the others. Sure. Uh, and I think, I think it's safe to acknowledge the White House is dealing with a lot of pretty difficult situations. Well, Joe Biden has right said no boots to put this temporary pier in, for instance. Does that go for all of Israel? Mm. I wouldn't say that. Um, That's significant. Uh, and and it, it also depends on what you mean by boots on the ground. Sure, of course. Uh, these, are, these are generally going to be overt, acknowledged forces. Mm -hmm. There's other stuff going on kind of uh, behind the scenes on the, in the covert sense, most, most assuredly. Uh, so what does it mean to not have boots on the ground? This is, we're starting to get into a pretty gray zone. Indeed. We'll continue with our panel ahead coming up. Mr. Johnson goes to Mar-a-Lago. This is not the start of a children's book. <laughs> we'll look ahead to the House Speaker's visit to the former president tomorrow which will be taking place right around this time. Clayton Lester will be back with us on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. I made the observation, not a declaration, the observation that if the speaker were to do the right thing and allow the House to work its will with an up or down vote on the national security bill, then I believe that there are a reasonable number of Democrats who would not want to see the speaker fall as a result of doing the right thing.
observation, not a declaration. I heard some things. <laughs> House Democratic leader Hakeem Jeffries choosing his words carefully today, talking about the danger that the Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, is in and whether Democrats might be there to save him if that time comes. Our panel is back with us, Lester Munson and Caitlin Legacki. Great to have you both at the table. Lester, the Speaker of the House is making tracks for Florida tomorrow. He'll be at Mar-a-Lago, and right around this time, uh, we'll be holding a joint news conference with Donald Trump. They're going to be talking about election integrity. This is being seen as a very significant move for the Speaker to fall in the arms of Donald Trump with a motion to vacate hanging over his head by Trump ally Marjorie Taylor Greene. Is that what this is about? This is job preservation? Well, I think it's about job preservation, but it's also about aid to Ukraine, which is the big vote that may be coming up next week. Yeah. We saw what the, pre what the former president can do to ha a House vote on the, on the FISA issue, mm -hmm. where his opposition probably drove the House to vote against the, the rule yesterday. So the Speaker is probably doing the politically smart thing by going to the person who can really make the difference on a House vote, get him to endorse or not oppose his plan on Ukraine aid, which is pretty much the same thing as protecting him as Speaker. So if he can keep Marjorie Taylor Greene as a caucus of one, yeah. then he's going to be successful. Okay, so you think it's a politically smart thing. I would note not everyone is in agreement on that. Certainly not the Congresswoman from Wisconsin, Gwen Moore, a Democrat. Oh. We talked to her earlier today about Mike Johnson's trip to Mar-a-Lago, and this is what she said. I'm very disappointed uh, that the speaker chose the path of going down to kiss the ring, as opposed to just working with the Democrats. Instead of flying down to Florida, why doesn't he walk across the hall and talk to Hakeem Jeffries? I just think that it's, you know, it's less time consuming and less expensive, and it's more integrity saving to do that. Caitlin, by going to Mar-a-Lago and possibly trying to convince Donald Trump to protect him, has he made it less likely that Democrats would ever <laughs> act to protect him? Based on Minority Leader Jeffrey's comments, I don't think so. I tend to agree that he has to go, and, and we're talking a lot about different types of containment today. That's how yeah. I view this trip to Mar-a-Lago, is if he can get Trump to a place where he's not going to oppose uh, the speaker moving forward with either Ukraine or FISA, I still think that uh, Jeffries will make sure that it has the votes it needs from Democrats to pass because, like he said, it's the right thing to do. So is this the equivalent of Mike Johnson handing the gavel over? To what extent is Donald Trump going to control the agenda of this House or is already controlling it, Lester? I think he's already controlling it. You know, the, the, the majority is so thin. It's two seats. It's going to go down to one seat, I think, here when mm -hmm. Mike Gallagher steps out of office. Uh, the 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 former president has huge sway with Republicans, particularly in the House. He can be the driver. He can be a difference maker. Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, portrays herself as a very strong ally of Donald Trump. So, so in a way, Mike Johnson is kind of circumventing her, trying to go around her to the main actor to get the thing done that he, I think he genuinely wants to get done, yeah. which is aid to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Well, Donald Trump didn't like the bipartisan border deal. It died. He yesterday said kill FISA, and a rule went down. Yeah. They're going to try again tomorrow, Caitlin. A revision, mm -hmm. still with reforms, now a two-year extension instead of five. We heard some pretty strong words from the former CIA director and former defense secretary, Leon Panetta, about why it's important. Should Johnson put this on the floor if he doesn't know the votes are there? We've seen rules go down, what, seven times, That's Joe? Right. This Congress? What, is it a bad whip count, or is this just, <laughs> I don't really care if it fails publicly? I think it's a bad whip count. I think it's no. so. It's an Emmer thing, possibly. Uh, I'm not the expert on the Republican conference, but I do think that this is an opportunity for him to start working with Jeffries and build that trust, mm -hmm. and get the votes that he needs from Democrats. And that will, you know, like Lester said, there's a two-vote margin, and that makes it a lot easier for him uh, to cut those losses on the Republican side and move forward with with bills that are absolutely in such essential right now. You've been to Mar-a-Lago. Mike Johnson is not the typical party goer you'd <laughs> see at Mar-a-Lago. Is Donald Trump He's too young? <laughs> too young, way too young. Trump let him DJ tomorrow night a little bit. Get on I don't the think iPad Trump with... lets anybody DJ. No, we should. Let's not get too ambitious here. Okay. That's a big deal. Little Abba for the speaker. Um, this is going to be interesting to see how he pulls out of this and the narrative that will follow. I guess uh, the next morning, the risks also of him getting trapped in something live with Trump on TV. Is he up for that? 
Uh, well, he's going to have to. He's, he's riding the tiger now. This is part of the job. He's the House leader for the Republicans. He, yeah. doesn't, he doesn't really have much of an option. As much as uh, the congresswoman was trying to give him some good advice, yeah. that's not the best advice for Mike Johnson. That might be the second best advice. And if this Mar-a-Lago trip doesn't work, maybe he, he does want to go to the Democrats and, and find a compromise deal. That's probably his order of battle. There you go. All right, Lester Munson and Caitlin Legacki, thank you both so much for joining us this evening. Make sure to as well check out the Washington Edition newsletter on the terminal and online. And tomorrow, Joe, yes. we're going to have full coverage of that news conference. You said it. It'll also be Friday on Balance <laughs> of Power. We'll see you then on Bloomberg TV and radio.